You're watching West Hartford Community Television. You're watching West Hartford Community Television. You're watching West Hartford Community Television. For the community, by the community. For the community, by the community. For the community, by the community. and you're watching Life and Style with Sarah. This evening on the Connecticut Fed Results Show, I am joined by Maureen Hazley Jones, the English lady, and we are going to talk about and conclude my four-month project on becoming a Connecticut locavore. In addition, we're going to talk about some of my successes and failures in my community garden, and Maureen's also going to share with us how to put our organic vegetable gardens to bed for the winter. Maureen, thanks for joining me. It's a pleasure, and it's wonderful to be with everyone again and hope you had a lovely season in your garden. It was a long season. It went very well. Um, but before we get to the garden, I just want to draw a few conclusions about this locavore thing mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that I've been doing over the, the summer. Right. Um, are you a fan of farmer's markets? I assume you oh, are. Oh, absolutely. That's a stupid question, isn't oh, it? <laughs> no, 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 no. No question is stupid. But yes, I'm definitely a fan. Yes. Definitely a fan. Do you have a favorite one? Yes, I do. Down in Old Lyme on Townwoods Road. It really is marvelous, and uh, we're supporting, you know, the local farmers mm -hmm. and organic gardeners, and very important to do that. So one of my conclusions on this project that I've been doing over the last four months was I started out thinking maybe this is going to be hard, and actually, it really wasn't that difficult. You don't have to go far in West Hartford. We have two farmer's markets, actually three, that run four days a week. Mm -hmm. um, there are farm stands in town. You don't even have to go five miles, and you're actually at the farm. So, oh, that's for sure. Yeah, yeah. so lots of supply, mm -hmm. and particularly in the summer. Yes. You know, summer's yes. an easy time to get, oh, yes. get produce. And then um, not just produce, but a lot of other things. So there are a lot of kind of cottage industries of people making things mm -hmm. out of the stuff that grows in Connecticut. Cheese, meat. Absolutely. Chickens, right. eggs. Mm -hmm. You don't have to go a few miles. You start seeing egg signs along mm -hmm. the, the roadside. Cheese, actually, Beaverbrook Farms in Old Line, mm -hmm. as well as um, lamb, organic lamb. Mm -hmm. Great stuff. I know, I, yeah, that, uh, that was surprising to me too. And then, um, are you a fan of wine? Yes, yes, I like a glass of wine. <laughs> Every once in a while. Particularly red. Yes. yes. Well, mm -hmm. it turns out that in Connecticut, you don't have to go, any place you are in Connecticut, within 20 miles, there's a vineyard. So Scott and I hit the wine trail this summer, mm -hmm. and we um, did a little bit of a tour, got a tour of how the wine is made, did some tastings, um, and I have a clip to share. Oh, you good. Want to see it? I'd love to see it. Take a look at Scott and Mai's experience on the Connecticut wine trail. And we're in Litchfield Hills, and we're going to check out the Connecticut wine trail. First stop, Miranda Vineyard. This is the Revolver to the Body Wine Festival. It's a liberation of country pounds. So our first stop on the wine trail was surprising. We drove in, there were lots of people driving in. It was surprisingly crowded. I don't know why I was expecting fewer people, but the tasting room was full, and it was a beautiful tasting room. There was live music, and Marilyn was a lovely woman who helped us taste six different of Miranda's wines. Scott and I enjoyed each of them, but we chose the Chardonnay as our choice from Miranda. And after we purchased our bottle of wine, we received our tasting cups with the package. It's one of those hot and steamy days in mid-August. What better to do than to take a tour of the Connecticut Valley Winery? Uh, my dad is a dentist in Orange, uh, still is, and I was a private investigator. We started making wine in his basement about uh, 13, 14 years ago. Um, and we started making really good wine, so we kind of blew up from then. It was, uh, about three and a half acres planted, so we planted um, about 16 different varieties. Uh, but that'll uh, distem the grapes, and we'll line like 30 of those up here. Um, put them about six inches from the top, add yeast to it for about two weeks. In those black buckets? Yep. yep. Okay. And then um, after about two weeks, we'll mash it down by hand, get it nice and juicy, let the yeast take over. And then we'll uh, chunky pump it right into this Europress. That's the P9 from Germany. It'll do a half ton at a time. 
Um, so we'll just press it. Um, it's a six cycle. Goes for about two to three hours per press, but it does a, a hell of a job, you know. Hmm. Um, and then we'll chunky pump it right into these tanks. Those are 264 gallon stainless steel tanks from Italy. We only use uh, stainless steel because uh, we don't like the taste of oak in our wines. We do add oak okay. more chips, but then we quickly rack it off because we don't like the taste of wood. For the past two years, all of our wines are 100% unfiltered. It takes a lot of the taste out, and we, we found that we won like a ton of awards more than we ever did if we didn't filter. We put all our wines in the smaller tanks before we bottle them. Um, just so everything's tasting good, it's on the up and up. If we need to change anything, we can do it easily. The wines are phenomenal for mostly Connecticut grape here, so. Great, well, let's try it. Yeah, let's try it. <laughs> yeah. Ruby Light, lighter in color, not calories. Don't get too excited. It's, <laughs> it's half red, half white, half our Frontenac and Chardonnay put together. Ruby. To be called a Connecticut wine, what, is, what are the... It's the goals? state minimum is 25%. It has to be 25% your own grape. In that bottle, not in that bottle. on average. Every one, of these, every one of these has to have at least 25% okay. uh, your own grape. Or, yeah. or, or a Connecticut grown grape. You can't call them a Connecticut grape yet. Yeah. To do what we're doing here is pretty. Really amazing. Not to pat ourselves on the back, but yeah, it's pretty it's amazing. Yeah. We were at Sunset Meadows Vineyards, and as we drove in, the parking lot was full, and there was someone directing traffic. And we, again, were detecting a pattern. This seems to be a very popular thing to do. And the gentleman who was parking us said that despite the down economy, everyone's enjoying the vineyards. So we're going to go in and check it out. No, it's not, I think there's only one. Right there. Did you go to any other one? to do five white wines. We decided we liked the Cayuga white the best, so that's what we bought. And then we also learned that you can do a passport to the Connecticut farm vineyards. And what you do is each vineyard on the wine trail that you visit, you get a stamp. And if you get 16 out of the 30 vineyards stamped, then you submit it and you can win a prize. So Scott and I have decided that for the next two weeks while our girls are at camp, we're going to try and get our passports filled and maybe we'll win a trip to Spain. So we never did make it to the 16 wineries that we, oh, I we were why. trying to go. <laughs> there just wasn't enough time and you know we had things to do but um, it's nice to know that it's out there. Oh, yes. um, I do want to mention that um, the owner of the vineyard that gave us the tour was a little bit shy about being on camera so his voice is in the background giving mm -hmm. us the tour. All right. Um, but, you know, the other thing that I discovered this summer, another conclusion is that um, by asking questions and meeting people, you realize there's a fantastic community out there of farmers and people who are so passionate about the things it's that they wonderful. produce. It's wonderful. Yes, it is. It's, it's a community sense, which we've lost, mm -hmm. and also the social aspect. Yes. You know, it's amazing how many new friends you can make and also how you can learn about how to, um, you know, grow organically, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. 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 I mean, Very all you important. have to do is ask, ask one question, and, and the farmer behind the stand is so excited to share with you yes. what he or she does, mm -hmm. and then is happy to pull his neighbor over to share what they do mm -hmm. and to send you across the way to their other neighbor mm -hmm. that grows something entirely different. Exactly. So it just, I, I loved that. I loved all the people I met this summer. Mm -hmm. Um, I do want to mention also that um, I've been blogging this summer about all Good. these different things that I've done. Right. And we don't have nearly enough time to cover even a portion of it this evening. Um, but if you are interested in more of the details and some of the other field trips that I took, you can go to my blog at sarahconnor.net and check that out. Good. And that's going to be an ongoing mm -hmm. project. Um, but uh, the other thing that you talked about, the sense of community, um, getting to know people. Um, the other thing was just learning, learning where your food comes from, which, yes. which people talk about. Very important. You're reducing the carbon footprint mm -hmm. and you certainly know because you can ask the people at the farmers market how did you grow this and most of them these days are saying organically grown. Right. So therefore no herbicides and pesticides. Right. Not contaminating. Right, yeah. or self-sustaining, mm -hmm. or um, you know, they take the byproducts of what they do. One of the vineyards, um, the SMV vineyard, um, they take the byproducts of their wine mm -hmm. production, mm -hmm. put it right back into the soil. Mm -hmm. um, they don't use pesticides. They are very sustainable. 
Particularly which, red wine is good for putting yes. back into the soil, the, uh, the, the grapes. Right, right. Mm -hmm. right. And right. so, that, I mean, and all I had to do is ask one question, and mm -hmm. I got a whole story about how, how they, their approach to making wine and mm -hmm. the sustainability of it, which I thought was, was Excellent. great. Excellent. And so I think my, my main conclusion about being a locavore and eating local is um, when you can, it's great to support the, the local producers. Mm -hmm. Um, the local economy, goodness right. knows, we all need that. Yes, we do. Um, but the most important thing is just understanding where your food comes from. Exactly. And exactly. how it's raised and mm -hmm. how it impacts the environment mm -hmm. and, um, and then thereby how it impacts you and your family when you eat it. Very, very important. Bring right. it back to the half. Right. 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 Mm -hmm. right. So it was, it was fantastic and I'll, I'll continue to do it, but I'm going to be doing other shows now, other mm -hmm. topics. So let's move to the garden. Maureen. <laughs> oh, dear. My garden. Well. <laughs> well, we started off well, didn't we? We, we did. did. We, we did. Way back, um, April. let's see, it was, we Late did April? it in April. The mm -hmm. show aired in May mm -hmm. of how we got started. Mm -hmm. Great start. Right. Um, lots of manure. Lots of manure. Mm -hmm. Lots and lots of manure. I've become good at shoveling manure. That's good now. <laughs> um, and I, there were some successes. Mm -hmm. um, so... Um, I have some pictures that we're going to go through, and I'll just list coming right. through. Right, and it was a very stressful season for the, for the vegetable garden, too. Between, yeah. Between, you know, occasionally some heavy rain, and then the other time just Nothing. terrible heat. And heat right. and humidity. Yeah, very yeah. stressful. So mm -hmm. these successes are extra special to me All because right. I, I beat those odds. Okay. So um, I did, I got carrots. Mm -hmm. um, and greens, mm -hmm. lots of greens. Mm -hmm. um, you can see on the table right. here potatoes, uh -huh. onions, and greens, and tomatoes, and greens, and greens. <laughs> a few, a little bit of squash mm -hmm. and greens. Mm -hmm. So the theme, greens. Greens grew really, really well. Excellent. Really Excellent. well, and just kept coming. This, mm -hmm. this is Swiss chard, and my, this is all right. from my garden, this bouquet. Well, look how lovely it looks in an arrangement. I know, isn't yes. that fun? And it oh, smells yeah. delicious, it too. It does, it does. You can smell the basil. There's basil in there, parsley. And, and the parsley, I love parsley. Mm -hmm. These are our little pest control geraniums. That's it. Um, and the Swiss chard. The mm -hmm. only problem with the Swiss chard, while it was extremely successful, you, cut, you just cut the stems, and then it keeps growing, keeps growing, keeps growing. My daughter decided it tasted like dirt. Oh, dear. So that was a little bit of a failure. <laughs> well, then you just have to camouflage it, that's all. Yeah, Yeah. like I'm making bean soup tonight, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sneak it in cut there. Cut some in. I'm going to cut some in Good. there and sneak it and in And also there. with the Swiss chard, just like all the lettuces too, you have to um, cut, uh, harvest them before they, what you, well, before they spring, which means before they get too old. Okay. Otherwise, they're tough. So how tough do you know in. that? Um, Pretty much as soon as they get to the nice leafy stage, you know. Okay. And then. So don't let them sit too long. No, don't let growing. them sit too long, okay. not at all. Okay. The New Zealand spinach that I grew mm -hmm. was great for the heat. I know, I saw the great photo. Great for right. the heat. So mm -hmm. the New Zealand spinach just, I mean, it was like mm -hmm. an octopus taking mm -hmm. over the garden, which is great because we did have a lot of, lot of heat and not a lot of water. Did you have a lot of lettuce too? At the beginning of the season, I did. And did you seed? I did not. You, okay, I just want to make one. Do not. Um, when you uh, when you had one one uh, crop go by, do not plant the same crop in that spot. Okay, not a okay. good idea. Okay. Okay. So that you move it to another. You know, you always keep a, a blank spot in the garden that okay. you can you can uh, put in there. All right. Very important to so you rotate. You don't want to re reseed the same thing. No. no. Even in within the season. No. Rotate. I knew within alternating seasons, but, but not. No. Rotate within the same Interesting. season. Interesting. Okay. Mm -hmm. I didn't know. That's a good. I will. Keep Put that, that up mind. here for next right. year. Um, the, um, let's see. So that was the things that did really well. Mm -hmm. Did you find the size of your plot a bit overwhelming with the it work? It was. It yes. was. I have to say, one of the, it, we'll move into the, the struggles mm -hmm. with the garden. One was the size. It mm -hmm. was big. It's a 20 by 20. Yes. I had six beds mm -hmm. plus things growing around the side. Mm -hmm. um, the weeds were tough. Mm -hmm. Watering. Yes. It was a challenge, particularly because it was a community garden. Mm -hmm. um, so I had to leave the house, purposefully go over mm -hmm. and water. And keep an eye also open for disease and for right. bugs. And so right. there definitely were weeks mm -hmm. where I did not make it over as much as I should have. Mm -hmm. So that, mm -hmm. was a huge, that was a challenge, right, right. for sure. Um, the two biggest issues I had was my beans. They started out... Fabulous, right. and I had a fantastic crop of these purple beans, 
which were great, um, grew, f grew and produced mm -hmm. for a long time. And I had a big pole of Blue Lake beans. Oh, they look beans. wonderful. Beautiful. Right. My daughter standing next mm -hmm. to them. I came back like a week later, and all of a sudden there were these little nibbly holes oh, yes. in the leaves. Oh, yes. And I came back a little bit later, and, mm. and there were these cute little ladybugs in my bean mm -hmm. plants. I'm like, oh, look at the ladybugs uh -huh. you're eating. Mexican beetles, right? Weren't ladybugs. Nope. Maureen, oh. what can I do about that? I, I, I tried. I mean, I saw there's a pictures of the beetles. I did one day go mm -hmm. and, and picked them and squished right. eggs. Two or and three picked. times a week, uh, pull them off. And if you catch it early enough, use the garlic spray. You know, the, the, the gallon mm -hmm. of water with five, uh, three crushed garlic cloves, a squirt of dish soap, and okay. uh, a little bit vegetable oil. So you, on the first sign of that? First sign of them, that's it. Give that a go. Okay. But if you've caught them late, nothing to do, love. You yeah. just have to take the whole um, thing out of the garden. Do not put it in the compost pile and throw it away. And make sure, okay. clean hands, do not touch any other plant while you're, you know, messing around with the beans and the Mexican beetles. Okay. Yeah. Can you use the garlic spray in advance in anticipation or no? Not really, no. No, no. no. Just once you see the first yeah, once you see, yeah, cute what? ladybug that isn't a ladybug right, in your exactly, plant, exactly. then spray. Yes. Okay. And the more fragrant things you have in the garden, the better. Mm -hmm. Although the Mexican um, uh, beetles, are, you know, they're tough little devils. Well, and everybody yes. in the community garden was suffering with them. Right. So I sort of felt like, you know, here I am picking these mm -hmm. beetles, but they're just going to come from the neighbor's plant and come right They are. Know? And, of course, um, some folks are not as um, particular, particular yeah. you know. And so um, if you've got a, for a healthy garden, it needs to be a clean garden. Yeah. That means you clean up any debris around okay. and um, wash your hands all the time. Keep your, your, your equipment also, you know, clean. Mm. So you're not yeah. spreading things. You really things. need to be fastidious. Very, very, okay. very Maybe important. Maybe that was yes. another one of my, one of my Right, years. right. Um, so, and then the other thing was my squash plants. I did plant a ton of squash, but we, we wanted to do pumpkins, mm -hmm. and I did patty pan. You can see a couple of the yes. patty pans that I did get. They're lovely. But it took a long time because what was happening was the flowers, lots of flowers, mm -hmm. and then they would just sort of squish up and shrivel mm -hmm. and fall. Mm -hmm. And then there was also what looked like powdery mildew. I'm not right. sure that's what no, it was. No, it's, it's botrytis rot. Okay. And actually, it's soil borne. And so, again, mm. you've got to get it out of the garden completely. Okay. And um, that's when you'll solarize the soil okay. if, if you'd like to this fall. Do um, you want me to mention that, how you do that a bit? Or, uh, Let's hold on the soil. All Let's right. keep that okay. with, our, with our winterizing. Got you. Um, mm -hmm. But, yeah. So, take, and, take but the, I should have taken them out. Take them out. Oh, yeah, I absolutely. I shouldn't have liked, just hoped they were coming no, out. No, once they've got any uh, sign like that, take them out. Yeah. The whole plant, or should I cut the leaves? No, the, the whole leaves? plant, the whole plant, yeah. because it's coming up through the soil. Ugh. Oh, yes. So that was frustrating. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the squash, well, that was, my family's not a big squash-eating mm -hmm. family. So, so that was not a big loss. It was not no, a big loss. No, no, no. And I have to say, you know, I would think it, maybe it was 50-50 what grew well and what didn't, mm -hmm. and I still felt like it, I did, it went 50 pretty 50 well. 50-50 is very good. And I learned a lot. Yes. I learned mm -hmm. a lot, and, I'm, and you're still teaching me, so. Good. The good. last thing, that I, before we get to winterizing, my peppers. Mm-hmm. I don't know what I did. I planted a bunch of pepper plants. Mm -hmm. um, I had basil in there for the fragrance, and they just, it was like they'd flower, and then nothing would happen. Mm -hmm. And then the leaves fell off, mm -hmm. and then... Although now there is a pepper growing. I, what happened? It sounds as if you had wilt there. Were the leaves curling before yes. they felt? Yes. All right. That, what is that? That's a leaf wilt. Again, it's another disease that comes up through the soil. Okay. Yeah. That's a bummer. It is. So is that kind of a risk of doing a community garden is you can't really control what's in the soil? It's a risk of doing any vegetable garden, love. It's okay. a matter of where you've got the plants from originally. If, okay. if you've not seeded, if you've bought plants. Right. Again, you have to be very careful that you've got you know, good, healthy plants. Well, these all came from um, a very reputable, local, mm -hmm. organic right. farm. Again, it just uh, traveled through the community garden. Yeah. Yes. So, because I was wondering, because it was shriveling, that maybe I, it was the heat, I wasn't watering enough. Someone had said, well, with the humidity and it's so hot, the bees aren't pollinating. 
I had all sorts of theories Oh, there going. were lots of bees around this yeah. summer, yes. The so wild it wasn't bees. the bees. <laughs> no, and the fact that all of your greens did so well, it meant that you were certainly watering well. Okay. Yes. So yeah, it was yeah. not the water. No, it was, no, So not that's at called all. wilt. Yes, yeah. And there's nothing you can do about that. No, love. No, you, so no, I should have just... That's it, yanked them. Pulled them out. Right. <gasps> that's depressing, mm. though. Because you had built the soil up beautifully, you know, yeah. with the compost and the manure. Right. Yeah, it's... Um, yeah, it's well, a shame. I guess that's just, it's like my, my mother-in-law taught me how to knit. Mm -hmm. And she said the first rule of knitting is you have to be willing to rip it out when exactly, you make a mistake. Exactly, exactly. Applies in the garden, too. You've got to rip it out. <laughs> Gardeners um, realize that there's going to be failures as much as success in a garden, mm -hmm. whether it's the main garden or the vegetable garden. And they love to talk about their failures. Right. And the point is if you can learn from them. Right. That's the so main thing. So next year, exactly, it'll be better. Exactly. So should we talk about winterizing? Yes, let's do that. So, all right. If you what do I do? I, I do still have my, my bean, my devastated bean things in there, so I got to get that out immediately. Get them out because okay. you certainly, any other leftover vegetables, you can chop those into the soil as a green manure, okay. but no, certainly no diseased stuff. So take the squash out, the beans out, the mm -hmm. peppers out, and anything that was diseased, okay? And how do I get rid of it? And then what you would do is um, there are two ways. Either you could plant a late potato crop which okay. a late potato crop cleans up the soil beautifully. Really? Yes, it does. It sucks everything That's out? That's it. sucks it all out. Or the other thing to do, because we don't know when, you know, the winter's going to mm -hmm. descend on us here, is solarize the soil, which means you get uh, clear plastic, four mils thick, spread it over clear the whole... Clear plastic. Clear plastic. Okay. That's it, love. Over the whole area where you've had the trouble and make sure you've, you're trenched around the outside, put soil to hold that plastic so it's touching the soil. Okay. And you leave that there so the sun can bake this, um, you know, the, the disease um, over this next four to six weeks. That treatment lasts for years. It does. It does. It really does. Okay. And then the other thing you, could, you can uh, do afterwards, um, you can put down, a, if you're going to have the same plot next year, mm -hmm. uh, yes. you can put down a nice layer of manure um, it could even be fresh manure because you're not going to be uh, doing anything in that garden until next May, okay. you know, late April, right. May. Put down about three inches of manure over, over, uh, over the garden so as well. Just sort of sit or um, put down a cover crop. And that's not just for your garden, but for any of our um, uh, veg gardens out there. A cover crop. Alfalfa has the most nitrogen. You can put down buckwheat, clover, rye. Wonderful um, to, to help, you know, anchor the soil, prevent erosion, and keep, make it healthy. And where, do you get those seeds just at a garden center? Oh, yes. Try and get organic seeds. Okay. So. Right. And you just broadcast it right. and let it grow. Right. There's um, uh, a company, I think it's called Botanical Interests. Okay. That's, uh, many of the, the, the stores around here have th those seeds, okay. organic. Okay. Yeah. And that goes for any garden. Yes. The, the heat treatment if you've had disease as well. The Absolutely. Plastic and yes. The, okay. Yeah. And then the potatoes, if you do the potato uh, Crop. method, right. you just, do you just leave them in there or do you chop them down once they've grown and leave once it for the winter? Once they've grown, um, then you would lift them. You know, you dig them up. Mm -hmm. You would not eat them. Okay. Because they, they've absorbed all that stuff from the yeah, soil. Ew. And then you, uh, probably be too late then to put a cover crop. So just put your layer of manure. Okay. So then I have a question about chopping down what's left. So mm -hmm. my tomato vines, um, I do, I have a picture of corn stalks. Mm -hmm. um, and they're pretty hard now. Mm -hmm. so if they're hard and you can't chop it, just take it out? Take it out. Okay. Any of the others that you've not let go too long, like okay. the tomatoes or whatever it is, chop it and you can use manure tea or seaweed tea okay. to help with the decomposition. To have a decomposition. Yes. So okay. just you just take a hoe and just chop, 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 chop. Yes, chop. absolutely. Okay. okay. Um, so what else? What, what else should we... We should be cleaning our tools, putting those cleaning away. Cleaning your tools, you know, absolutely. And also, too, um, if you have any herbs in your garden, you oh, know. Oh, yes. yes. Tell me about that. You mentioned you that. You can take some cuttings from your herbs, ones that you really enjoy. Um, you can root them either in water or in sand. And they'll root very quickly in two or so three weeks. In the sand, you just put them in the yeah, sand. Yeah, in sand, and they'll root. Yeah, and then the sand you, doesn't have to be wet. You are. Oh, you, you wet oh, the oh sand. yes, you wet the sand. Wet sand. Okay. Oh, you, <laughs> and you keep the sand wet, right? <laughs> okay. And um, then, um, then you'll transfer them to small pots, and you'll have them in sunny windows. Oh. And then the other thing to do is make sure you bring your rosemary plant. 
Okay. We, many of us have uh, rosemary in the garden. Bring rosemary inside, it will not survive the winter. Make sure you spray it every week and give it a thorough watering every week too. And then you can bring it back out in the when next the gets June. Warm. Yeah, beginning of June next year. Okay. And um, also, uh, the herbs you have in your garden, dry some. Now, how do you do that? Harvest in the morning, okay. never rip, um, make sure that you clip because if you rip, you'll lose a lot of the volatile oils in the herbs. Okay. And like um, thyme and um, uh, sage, uh -huh. tarragon, all those wonderful things. Right. Take them in, wash them gently, mm -hmm. even in one of those salad spinners. Remember the salad mm -hmm. spinner? I have a salad spinner. Actually, Still use do it. Do that uh -huh. and then separate them into small bunches. Okay. Um, Use not string because string will, um, when it's dry, it'll loosen and you'll lose some of the herbs. Use rubber bands and then in a, um, a cool, damp, I mean a dry spot, like a spare bedroom or something like okay. that or an attic, put a string across, attach these little uh, bunches uh -huh. so that, you know, the, the, the herbs are, are down, hanging. right, okay. with like a paper clip to, to, the, um, to, to the line. And in a couple of weeks, they'll be ready for going into... Own. Yeah, you, then you take the leaves off, put them in a, a glass jar, seal the top, mm -hmm. and put them in a nice dark, cool cupboard, and you'll have these lovely herbs. Fresh herbs. Fresh herbs. Yeah. Makes such a difference, because so many of the herbs in the shops, they've languished on those shelves for months. Right, you don't know how long they've right, been there. Right, right. You know, that's the other thing that's been so great over the summer is... Um, you know, the, the things that I've actually grown. But then going to the farmer's market or my farm share was, was fantastic. Mm -hmm. Every week getting a whole new fresh supply of vegetables, fr uh, fruits and vegetables. But I did a whole show in my September show about preserving these things mm -hmm. because you still benefit from the flavor of the locally grown fresh it, at its peak in the middle of winter. Absolutely. And these herbs, it's the same thing. Right, you can right. still enjoy your basil or your parsley mm -hmm. or whatever it is, rosemary. Well, I still have uh, peaches from last year, you know, that, that I put in the freezer. In the freezer. Yes. Yeah, yeah mine was on freezing. I didn't right. can, I froze. Mm -hmm. but, right, um, with the fruit fresh you put yes. in there. Mm -hmm. And that works, you know. Very simple. Very, oh, easy. Yeah. Absolutely. And yeah, there are lots great. of resources online um, on how to do that. Mm -hmm. um, I did have an experiment. I, I canned some salsa. I'm very proud of myself. <laughs> and I'm going to give you a jar. Oh, and you thank take you. it home I'd and you tell that. me what you think. All right. My, I followed the blue bell, blue ball recipe. Mm -hmm. um, and that's another way. You know, you can make these things. And then my husband was saying, gosh, you know, in the middle of winter, we can, like, we have to save it for winter because that's so special to you have it. You can even it. do that with fresh corn. You don't even have to cook it. You oh, know. really? No, just take off the, you know, the outside uh -huh. and um, put it in a, a sealed plastic bag. Right. If you've got one of those sealer meal type things, that's even yep. better. Yep. And put, put it in the freezer. Huh. Yeah, I was surprised too. I didn't realize you could do that with fresh corn right. and not have to blanch it first. Yeah, so, see, the yeah. instructions that I got were that you did have to blanch it. No, I, I got this from my Joy of Cooking book. Huh. You know, and I tried it. Um, I've been but, doing extra work. Huh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, about three weeks ago, I, I froze my first lot, you know, yeah. color has kept, and right. uh, yes. Right. Yeah. Well, and things, I know farmer's markets are going to continue through, this is October, but, you know, a lot of the farmer's markets go through November, you mm -hmm. get your winter, you right. know, your winter veggies and things, and mm -hmm. then some, you know, they stay open all winter, but, you know, it's slimmer yes. pickings, it's yes. a different right. variety of things, but mm -hmm. you can still get your local cheeses, mm -hmm. the meat, um, mm -hmm. you know, the winter crops, things that have saved. So. Well, also, look with all the apples that are out now. I'm right? so, I want to make apples. I take them from my apple tree, you know, yeah. it's loaded in, in right. the field, and I have a large drying basket, you know, mm -hmm. um, uh, it used to be for flowers. It's up in a spare room which doesn't have heat in it. Oh, so and you make sure that the app, you lay the apples on the on the basket. Make sure they're not touching, and they stay wonderful for maybe about four months. Right. Well, yeah. I'm I'm going to do that this year because I I love apple picking and. I think we've covered almost everything we wanted to, which is a miracle. I think so, too. <laughs> and I we talked very fast, but... <laughs> you, you should be congratulated, love, on Thank this effort. You. And Thank I hope you. you'll do it next time Thank and you'll you. enjoy well, it. Well, I will definitely. I am going to keep going. Mm -hmm. I'm going to keep... You know, we have adjusted some of our things to local, locally grown, the mm -hmm. thing, you know, and I, I am going to take good notes on how to do my garden even better next year. Um, thank you for joining me and helping me conclude my con Connecticut Fed series. It's a pleasure, love. It really is. 
I'm Sarah Connor, and you've been watching Life in Style with Sarah. I hope you've enjoyed eating local with me all summer. Don't forget to tune in next month to a brand new episode of Life in Style with Sarah.